Hi, my name is Umang and I'm an engineer here at Data Theorem. And today I'm going to be talking about some of what's new and what's changed in Android 11 in terms of security and privacy. So every year Google releases a new version of the Android OS to go along with their new devices. In addition to that, they also add new APIs and changes so that developers can take advantage of the new platform security features. So every year when Google's Android team does this, we here at Data Theorem dig into these releases and find out what's changed and what developers need to do to stay compliant. We do all that research on your behalf and also work this into the Data Theorem security analysis engine. We made this presentation so that you're aware of some of the changes that are being made. All right. So at a high level, Android 11 in particular brings some changes in terms of user privacy, as well as offering some new and updated APIs that developers can leverage to increase security within their apps. So broadly, Android 11 brings about five changes. First is additional access control over data storage. Second, an improved permissions model. Third, stricter controls over package visibility to other apps. Fourth is data access visibility. And in the end, we'll also be going over some of the new APIs that have been introduced. All right, so before we get into the changes corresponding to data storage on Android 11, it's important that we understand how data storage permissions and APIs have evolved over the years. So we'll start off with Android versions 1 to 6. So on Android versions 1 through 6, permission details were displayed to the user on the Play Store itself as a pop-up with the user having no option but to grant all permissions requested by the app. A screenshot illustrating this point uh, can be seen on the current slide. So as far as storage per related permissions were concerned, there were two. Uh, so that the first one is Android dot permission or dot read external storage. The second was write external storage and these permissions are still there. So as you can see, the names of these permissions are self explanatory. Read external storage is responsible for reading data from external storage and write external storage facilitates the ability to write to external storage. Also keep in mind that on Android systems, the term external storage doesn't refer to just removable storage media like SD cards, but also areas of on-device storage that are not exclusive to the app. All right, so now we've seen Android versions one to six and how storage was handled in these versions. Now let's look at Android versions six to nine and see uh, what changed. So the major change introduced with Android 6 was the concept of runtime permissions. So this was a step towards providing end users more granular control over granting of potentially dangerous permissions. The new permission mo permissions model actually forced developers to request permissions only after app launch and encouraged permissions to be requested only when spe a specific flow of the app required it. And this was a great improvement over the previous versions which we just discussed because in those versions, users were forced to grant all permissions at once from a single pop-up message, even before the app was installed. So on this screen, you should be able to see a sample code snippet for requesting the ability to uh, write to external storage. And on the right is the resultant pop-up message UI prompting the user to grant the permission. All right, so now that we've discussed how storage permissions worked on previous versions of Android, Let's take a look at the changes introduced in Android versions 10 and 11. So with the release of Android 10, Google introduced the concept of scoped storage. This was introduced to protect app data, give users more control over their files and to limit file clutter. So the primary idea is to separate storage into collections and to limit the broad access to shared storage. So right now on the screen, you should be able to see a diagram that illustrates the scoped storage concept on newer versions of Android. On the left are the types of storage available on the device for the app, which is private app storage. Uh, sorry, on the left are types of storage available on the device for the app. So we have private app storage on top and the shared storage block below it. 
The private app storage section's name is self-explanatory and is accessible only to the app itself. This includes both internal as well as external private storage. The shared storage section consists of media collections for photos, videos, audio, and it also uh, contains the downloads collections and other shared files. So from the diagram, it's clear that scope storage is compulsory in Android 11 and efforts have been made towards nudging developers into using the privacy-friendly storage APIs. So what were the three primary uh, results of this change? First, full access to external storage is no longer available to apps. Second, you have unrestricted access to your own app storage. So your app can read and write data to its own external storage and no permissions are needed. So this helps in uh, reducing the abuse of the read-write permission Moreover, when an app is uninstalled, the data in its own external storage gets deleted, deleted as well. So this reduces unnecessary clutter on the device. And the third point being that apps can no longer access data in other apps' external storage directories. With scoped storage enforced, apps can only see their own data folders plus certain multimedia types using other storage APIs. All right, so taking the discussion about multimedia files forward, uh, we also noticed that apps have unrestricted access to contribute files to media collections and to downloads. So this way, if you want to save images, audio, video, or any other document, you can do so without any permission, as long as it's saved in the organized media collections. However, if you want to access and modify media files that other apps have created, the read-write external storage permission is essential. Moreover, the only way for apps to access non-media storage is that the user has to explicitly provide access by using UI components such as file picker intents. So next up, uh, we will be discussing storage access that may be given to special apps via the managed external storage permission. So the Manage External Storage permission is a new permission that has been introduced in Android 11. This permission can give your app access to all shared files. So essentially the shared external storage block here in this diagram at the bottom, everything in here can be accessed by the Manage External Storage permission. So this means that uh, this permission doesn't give your app access to other apps external storage directory, which is good for security. Uh, another point that is that needs to be noted is that apps targeting Android 9 and below will still have access to the entire external storage with the read write external storage permission. That being said, uh, we would advise all developers to exercise caution while utilizing the manage external storage uh, permission and its corresponding APIs because Google Play had recently sent out a notice to all developers on their platform cautioning them against using this permission unless they have a very good reason for doing so. The notice also mentioned that utilization of privacy-friendly APIs such as the storage access framework is recommended. The manage external storage permission should only be used as a last resort when the other APIs are insufficient to complete the task at hand. So the usage of this permission will be strictly regulated by Google during the app review process, and they may prevent publishing of apps that are not able to justify usage of this permission and its corresponding APIs. So that's it for scoped storage. Um, now we'll move on to the next topic, which is uh, permissions. So I'll quickly go over the uh, three important points uh, regarding changes to the permissions framework in Android 11. First up, specific UI workflows have been encouraged in order to help users to make more informed choices about the data they grant access to and when it may be accessed by the apps. Second, the new version of Android moves the onus of making privacy decisions away from just the user. Now the Android OS tries to assist users in making these choices. What this essentially means is that the Android OS intermittently tries to prompt the user into following security best practices through informative and actionable prompts and notifications. Overall, there's much greater transparency with regards to permissions granted to apps. All right, so the biggest change in Android 11 
uh, with regards to permissions is the concept of one-time permissions. So on this slide, you should be able to uh, see two screenshots of the same app on different versions on Android. These screenshots specifically correspond to permission request pop, uh, to the permission request pop-up that is shown to the end user. On the left, we have the permissions pop-up for Android 10, and on the right, we have the permissions pop-up for Android 11. So you'll notice that on Android 10, the user has two options. First is uh, allow all the time, and the second is allow only while using the app. So this implies that in Android 10, the focus was on, dis on the user deciding whether the permissions need to be granted for foreground or background processes. Uh, so moving to Android 11, we can see that the focus has shifted to giving the users more granular access to when the permissions can be granted. So users can either give a one-time approval or allow it whenever the app is being used. By default, the background permission access cannot be requested through this UI, whereas it could be requested uh, in the previous UI in Android 10, which is a good thing. Thus, the permissions framework you'll realize has evolved to give the users greater control in Android 11. Users now have the option to temporarily grant permission, valid only for a single use by an app. The permission grant remains valid when the app is in the foreground, either as a visible activity or as a foreground service. This grant expires a short period after the app is moved into the background. And the good thing is that app developers won't have to make any new changes to their code base on Android 11 to remain compliant. So as long as you've been following permissions best practices, you know, uh, your code is, uh, code follows the permissions best practices, you don't have to make any changes, things will work just fine. And since we were discussing uh, background access, now uh, let's look at uh, the access background location permission. So access background location is a new permission introduced in Android 11. The primary difference is that now background location has been made clearer and more actionable. And the framework encourages a specific workflow to be followed. We will be discussing this workflow in upcoming slides. Um, another important point that needs to be noted is that requesting this permission by itself doesn't give, give an app location access. It has to be requested in conjunction, conjunction with either access course location or the access find location permission. So let's look at this in further detail. So now here we have a good example of the specific workflow that has been enforced for requesting background location permissions. So on the screen, you should be able to see three images. In step one, we request the user for foreground location access. Once the, uh, the foreground location permission is granted, we move on to step two where we show an in-context UI explaining why the app needs background location access. If the user is convinced that background location should be provided to the app, we open up the location settings page in step three, where the appropriate option can be selected by the user. So if you look at it, the primary goal of this workflow is to ensure that background location permission is granted only after the foreground permission is granted, Moreover, the app is supposed to explain to the user about why it needs those permissions. This flow also compels end users to jump through multiple screens before the permission is granted on the app settings page. So, then again, this makes the, uh, the user think and hopefully make an, an informed and privacy conscious decision. So this, uh, this is a very uh, good change in our opinion. And now let's move on to permissions best practices. So permissions, these practices have been around for some time, but there has been renewed focus from the Android team on uh, enforcing these practices for requesting permissions, as not following these practices may result in degraded behavior in future versions of Android. So I'll briefly go over what these best practices are for requesting permissions. So if you see the code snippet on the screen, there are three methods that need to be implemented in order to be compliant with the officially recommended best practices. A significant number of uh, developers tend to skip the second method, which is should show request permission rationale in their implementations. 
So this method is responsible for showing the user a UI that explains why a permission is being requested. As of today, it's an optional implementation, but it comes highly recommended since in future versions, it may become compulsory. So developers who skip this might uh, risk ending up with an app that doesn't function well in newer Android versions. So that's it for the permissions best practices. Uh, let's look at another uh, new thing in Android 11, which is automatic revoking of runtime permissions by the OS. So this slide is specifically about a new behavior introduced in Android 11 that automatically revokes permissions granted to an app if it remains unused for a long time. So an interesting statistic released by Google says that the average smartphone user has 75 apps on their phone and only interacts with about 30%. So this means that there could be a lot of applications in the background that may be collecting data through APIs gated behind permissions that were granted by users a long time ago. And this was the motivation behind this new Android OS feature that revokes permissions and informs the user through a notification. However, this is something that could break the functionality of certain applications. So the API has the provision of setting flags in the manifest, which can enable or disable the revoking of permissions for a specific app. So these auto uh, revoke flags can have three values. Uh, the first value is uh, flag value is allowed. Setting the flag value to allowed implies that your app can gracefully re-request permissions if they get revoked by the system, which means your app is completely compliant with the latest version of Android and is following best practices. The second possible uh, value which you can set for the auto revoke flag is discouraged. In this case, an app may ex experience a slightly degraded functionality if permissions are revoked and hence if this flag is set, the system will try not to revoke the permissions. But it may still revoke them in really extreme cases. Now the third auto revoke flag value which you can set is disallowed. So what this does is that it exempts the app from getting its permissions revoked by the system. However, uh, developers should be cautious about relying too much on setting the flag to disallowed as this is something that could, could get deprecated in future versions of Android. And so yes, so we would recommend following best practices and not relying too much on the disallowed flag because tomorrow, tomorrow if Android 12 gets released, your app's functionalities might break. All right, so next up, uh, we will be discussing changes uh, pertaining to package visibility in Android 11. Right at the top of the slide, you should be able to see some APIs that are commonly used to detect apps or packages installed on a phone. These APIs are easy to use. They did not require any permissions in previous versions of Android. And hence, they resulted in malicious apps silently collecting data and tracking all the packages users install on their device, which is terrible for security. So this essentially implies that on older versions of Android, all apps and installed packages were visible to all the other apps. So the good thing about Android 11 is that it doesn't let um, your app query a list of all installed apps or packages on the device by default. However, if you are a developer who really needs this information for some specific functionalities, then there are ways to overcome this restriction. The first is by whitelisting certain packages and the second is by requesting the query app packages permission. Uh, we will be uh, discussing these two methods in the upcoming slides. So let's go there. All right. So on the screen, you can see two code snippets which illustrate recommended whitelisting techniques. The first code snippet illustrates how certain packages can be whitelisted by explicitly specifying their names in the manifest. So let's look at the first uh, code snippet. So in here we have your manifest file. The manifest file has a, uh, the queries tag. So the queries is a new tag that has been introduced. And inside this queries tag, you can put in the names of packages which you want to whitelist. So in this example, we have two packages that have been whitelisted, com.example.store and com.example.services. That means whenever you request um, 
use the whenever you use the package manager API to get a list of installed apps these two apps will get fetched and all the other uh, apps on the phone will will not be fetched and the only other apps that you will be able to see are system apps which which are uh, public by default I mean not all system apps specific uh, system apps which are useful to others so uh, now let's look at the second code snippet so another way of uh, uh, whitelisting certain types of packages is by specifying intent filters so in this you'll see that inside the queries tag we have an intent tag and we are specifying an action and data so the action is sent and the data type the mime type is image jpeg so basically this will allow the app to fetch a list of your app to fetch a list of all apps that have the capability to perform the send action with an image data type so this is another way you can get a list of applications which can handle an intent of this format so th these two are the recommended ways for whitelisting package names or whenever you need a list of installed uh, apps on on the device now we will move on to the query all packages permissions so this is a newly introduced permission so google recommends that apps should you ideally use the query tag which we discussed earlier in the manifest to specify package names instead of this permission as the level of ac uh, information accessed by this permission is excessive and not needed by most applications so only apps in specific categories such as file explorers device management and security really need this permission using this permission essentially allows developers to get a list of all packages installed on the phone similar to um, previous uh, versions of android however developers are advised to be careful while using this permission as google intends to provide guidelines for apps that need this permission and apps that don't comply with those guidelines may get blocked from the play store and again if your app doesn't have a good reason to use this permission uh, it may get blocked from the play store in the uh, during the review process so that's it about package visibility uh, now let's move on to data access visibility so data access visibility is a new feature that has been introduced in android 11 the primary objective behind this feature is to help developers better understand their patterns of data access before proceeding further uh, let's look at the diagram on the screen so on the left we have a representation of the application code base which has three types of code uh, code that's recently added code belonging to libraries and legacy code and on the right we have examples of some commonly used private private data belonging to users such as location contacts microphone so from the diagram we can see that certain permissions and private data may be used by multiple code snippets throughout the code base and it tends to be difficult to keep a track of this usage especially in the case of malicious third party libraries so apps may use several uh, third party uh, libraries and these libraries may try to access sensitive data based on a permission granted for a completely different use case such access it becomes difficult to identify moreover large applications have large teams of developers working on them leading to fragmented ownership and abandoned code thus it is possible for multiple pieces of code or functionality to access a particular piece of sensitive data and it is not always easy to tell where and how that's happening so that's the problem that the data access visibility uh, uh, changes are trying to uh, that's the pro problem that the data access visibility API is trying to fix so let's look at how it does that so in order to uh, enable data access visibility two changes have been made to the app ops manager API so the first change is the introduction of a new callback so this is a callback on data access uh, the specific name is set on op note called call uh, set on op noted callback on the screen you should be able to see a code snippet illustrating how the callback may be used for logging or recording suspicious access to user information uh, the second uh, change that has been introduced is feature tagging so a new method called create attribution context has been introduced 
This method allows developers to tag legitimate uses of privacy sensitive APIs. Tagging allows developers to filter out valid usages in the data access callback. So what the data access visibility functionality does is that it allows us to instruct the system to inform us each time the code access accesses a sensitive uh, piece of information. We are able to get various details about the code snippet accessing the information. The attributes that can be recorded include the stack trace, the type of data uh, being accessed, the frequency of access, and the attribution tags. Once all of this information is received, it's up to the developer to tackle unauthorized usage of privacy sensitive APIs by third party libraries by either removing them or accepting the risk. Uh, next, let's uh, discuss changes to foreground services. So apps targeting the new API version get two new foreground service type tags for the camera and the microphone. Not adding these tags on this API version, would, uh, that is API version 30, would result in the Android OS throwing a security exception. And there's one restriction that needs to be kept in mind uh, with regards to foreground services. If the app starts a foreground service while running in the background, and then in that case, the foreground service cannot access the microphone or camera. Moreover, the service cannot access location unless the app has background location access. And at the bottom of the screen, you should be able to see a sample code snippet where you can, where of an example of, that specifies the foreground service type. Now let's uh, quickly go over some other API changes introduced in Android 11. First up are some changes to the biometric API. So the primary change with regards to biometrics is that a new interface has been introduced, which can be used to declare the types of authentication that the app supports. The introduction of the interface also implies that the biometric prompt flow has been decoupled from the activity lifecycle. This makes it easier for developers to integrate biometrics with various app architectures. Also, one very important point is that three levels of authentication are supported by this new interface. The first is biometric strong, second is biometric weak, and third is device credential. So it's important to understand why these three types are needed. So the thing is that a lot of smartphone manufacturers include biometric hardware such as fingerprint scanners on their devices, but the level of security across implementations may vary. For example, a fingerprint scanner belonging to a high-end device might have a significantly better hardware and software implementation than that belonging to a low-cost device from a security standpoint. The Android compatibility definition document defines the quality of biometrics for each device on the platform as class 1, class 2, and class 3, with class 3 being the most secure. Hence, this change allows developers to specify the biometric authenticator strength required by their app to unlock or access sensitive parts of the application. So, if you are a developer working on an app that handle, handles sensitive user information or financial transactions, such as a banking app, you would probably prefer using strong biometric authentication only, which would autom automatically re reject devices with lower security standards. Uh, so that's it for the biometric uh, API changes. Again, to conclude, if you are uh, working on an app that handles sensitive data, we would strongly recommend using the biometric, uh, uh, biometric strong uh, as, the strength, uh, as the strength of the authenticator in your app. And otherwise, you, you, you can make do with uh, lower authenticator strengths. Uh, and last, let's look uh, briefly look at the Identity Credentials API. So this new API is primarily aimed at bringing electronic IDs to mobile devices. In its current form, it in includes classes and interfaces corresponding to certain newly introduced ISO standards for digital IDs. These classes internally ensure that necessary standards for digital signing, encryption, and data sharing are maintained. As a result of this, developers now have a reliable framework that may be used for storing digital IDs and verifying their authenticity. As of now, there is very limited documentation on the official Android developer website, as this is a new feature, and standards for digital IDs are still being debated. 
But this is an interesting development that we are excited about and we thought we should share it with you. Um, all right, and to conclude the presentation, so in summary, we went over, uh, as we went over, Android 11 primarily uh, builds upon changes introduced in Android 10, thereby improving user privacy, as well as offering some new and updated APIs that developers can leverage to increase security within their apps. All of the content of this presentation uh, is stuff that's going to be checked for in the data theorem analyzer. The goal of this presentation was to give you a heads up so that you're aware of all the security changes that have been introduced in the latest version of Android.